It is good to be with you this morning. As always, we have some in this assembly who are our guests, and we're very, very glad to have you. That speaks well of you, that you would be inclined this morning to assemble with people who have spiritual things at the forefront of their minds, and you obviously do that. So thank you very much for being here, and I want to thank those who are watching our online uh, service as well. We're glad to have you with us. Let me mention before I begin the lesson in earnest that tonight the group that was to have met at the Hortons will now be meeting at the Richardsons. So if you are a part of those groups, that particular group, make that note. You will be meeting at the Richardsons home instead of the Hortons home tonight. This is a lesson that started out <clears throat> one direction and, and kept going the same direction. It just, it's just going to stop a little earlier than I had intended, okay? I, that may mean nothing to you. I say that to help, help me stay focused on what I want to say this morning. So you're going to hear probably a second part of this at some point if, if the Lord wills, but I'm not sure exactly when that might be. In the Old Testament... God used the figure of a vine and a vineyard and a vine dresser and grapes and husbandry and a lot of words like that. He used that an awful lot to talk about Israel. We talked about it some last week from Matthew 23. We looked at a parable from Matthew 23. And so Jesus very often used that metaphor, if you will, to express how he felt and how his father felt about Israel. And in the Old Testament, when he used that figure, it never ended up good. God planted, God did this for Israel. Israel was the true vine at the time and What's interesting about that imagery in the Old Testament, it never ended good. It never was God planted you and here's the wonderful harvest that has now been reaped. It never ended that way in the Old Testament. I find that interesting. So interesting that every time the prophet probably talked about it, I'm sure there were people in his audience who went, you have got to be kidding we're going to talk about this again. Let me give you a taste, pun intended. Let me give you a taste of what the prophets said. Isaiah 5, Now let me sing to my well-beloved the song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it, so he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why wild grapes? And now, please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge, and it will be burned, and break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I'll also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression... For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. That wasn't the only time Isaiah talked about it. But that's, that gives you a real good taste, doesn't it? Or well, this passage in Jeremiah 2. Yet I planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. And how then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? 
a degenerate plant of an alien vine. And that's not how it was planted. Or this passage in Hosea, the 10th chapter and verse 1, Israel empties his vine. He brings forth fruit for himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altar. That gives you an idea of why there's been no real fruit that's been produced. So that tells you why those prophets continued to use the imagery because they understood that. Israel was God's original vine and it failed. So I want you to turn your Bible to John 15. But before we look at that, I want to, to, I want to show you some things about vines in the first century. I want to show you a few things about vineyards in the first century. And you would expect most of this probably. In the first century, grapes grew all over Palestine. <laughs> They needed lots of tender, loving care to create and to produce the best product. The ground had to be clean and it had to be kept clean. I mean, the weeds didn't come up in vineyards. And before those, those plants were planted, those shoots were planted, the, the, the ground was cleaned. And the vines grew in various places. They grew in several different places. The trellises is where they grew. They also grew on low fork sticks that were close to the ground so that they could run. They grew over doorposts of cottages. But the vines grew just about anywhere vines could grow. And the slips were planted 12 feet apart because once the vine was planted and once it was nourished and once it got what it, what it needed, it would spread very quickly across the ground or above on the vine. It would, it would spread quickly. Drastic pruning in the first three years took place and there was no fruit. The vine didn't produce anything if it was not at least four years old because it kept being pruned back. And the wood of the vine was too soft for use. When any part of the vine, any part of that which was wood, it was never used for anything else. As a matter of fact, when the harvest came, all of the wood, all of the vines, anything that was like that, they took it down and they made big piles and they burned it. They had bonfires. Because the wood was too soft to use. Couldn't use it for anything else. There were only fruitful and non-fruitful Branches. And that seems reasonable, but I mean, it either produced well or it didn't produce at all. There really wasn't any in between because of the care that had been given to the branches prior to the time of it bearing fruit. And of course, for our purposes, I would tell you that Jesus knew who the unfruitful were. He knew who the fruitful were too. And I think the primary Contrast, and the primary point is that you Jews who don't believe in me, you're not going to bear any fruit. And then maybe an extended point of view is those of you who would believe in me, but who would, would go back and who would become apostates because you, you refuse to stay in me, or in terms of the, of the, of the language we're going to look at, because you, ref you refuse to abide in me, I'm going to cut you off. Now, there are a lot, of, a lot of things to understand about that. And I'm not going to cover all those this morning. I don't know that I could cover all of them, but we could go down that road and we could think about those kind of things. But I want to go down a particular road with you. And this is where in my study, I was going to go down this road briefly, but it just made me stop. So I want us to read what Jesus said. This is John 15. I would much prefer you to look down than for you to look up. I'm just going to tell you that. I would much prefer for you to open your Bible and for you to read along in your Bible, in your text, as opposed to looking up here. Sometimes this is easier. I get that. And I have them up here because there are some people that can't. You, you've got other responsibilities on the pew you're on and by the people you sit by. But I, I, I prefer you, and I want, I'll just tell you that, I prefer you to read out of your own Bible. But I'll have it up here, okay? This is John 15, beginning in verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. 
Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. If I ask you, after the reading of those eight verses, what jumps out? What, what, what just jumps out on the page? When you look at these words, what is it that just stands out? I'm, I'm going to tell you what stands out to me. What stands out to me is the eight times, the seven or eight times he uses the word abide. If you abide, if you abide, if you don't abide, if you abide, if you abide. That just stands out to me. And so, the obvious point is, I think, the issue is that we are to stay connected. We're to stay connected. Stay connected to this vine. Because... We can become loosed from the vine. Disconnect comes from loosening. I want to. I want to share. I want to share some thoughts with you now. I want to tell you a story first. It's a true story. It's a true story that's developed this week. I am familiar with a family who has been strong spiritually for at least three generations. The, the man who I know the best has been an elder in the church for many years. His sons grew up and became to this point, deacons in other places. One of his sons taught his future wife the gospel and she became a Christian. And then they began to have a family. They worshiped at a church where probably six or seven years ago, I held a meeting. And I'd known him in the past pretty well. A few years ago, I went back to the same place and held another meeting. First time I was there, they didn't miss a service. Not only did they not miss a service, they had me in their home. And we visited and we rehashed some common memories and some common associations and we enjoyed our time together. When I returned for the second trip, they, weren't, they never were there. They didn't come at all. And to be totally honest with you, while I was there the second time, it just never dawned on me that they weren't there. I don't, I don't, that, that probably shouldn't have happened, but I just didn't think about it. And this week, I have found out that this man, younger man, probably now in his, I would guess in his 40s, may possibly even late 40s, had been arrested 
and had been charged with some things that I cannot repeat, would not repeat in this audience for various reasons, but it is very egregious. And when confronted by his wife, he admitted to it. What you're asking if I have done, he said, yes, I have. And the authorities were called and he will face serious time behind bars in prison. How does that happen? How does that happen? The two friends who are, are mutual friends of his and me, the two of us have had a couple of conversations. And that's been the question. How does it happen? How does what's happened to him and now his family, how, how could that have happened with all the background that was there that he was a part of for all those years? Disconnect from the vine comes when it's loosened. I want us to think practically about this for just a moment this morning. And I guess I'm going to ask the question for us is how connected are you to the true vine? We understand that when a hose, a water hose has to be tightened to a hydrant, we understand that that connection needs to be tight. And to, un, and to undo that connection, there has to be typically several turns in a counterclockwise motion typically to undo that hose. And if it's tight, that initial unloosening is what's going to allow you to continue to unloose that hose so that you can completely disconnect. But that's not going to happen with one turn. Not if it's tight. Not going to happen. Or if you're trying to open a jar and the jar is, the, the lid's tight, you, you may have to really squeeze. You may have to get another object to help you so that you can get a better grip on that. We understand that. Or to loosen a nut from a bolt. There's a, there are a million illustrations. But disconnect comes from loosening. Do you think that what I just described to you could ever happen to you? Do you think what I just described, do you think that man I just described, men, do you think that what I just described to you can happen to you or me? You know the answer to that, don't you? The answer is yes. It can happen. And it did happen to this man. And I would have never expected it. And the people who know him would never have expected it. And the friends that are our mutual friends, we, we, we never expected that. As a matter of fact, if I could, and I won't, but if I could share the threads with you this week between me and these other two people, you, you, uh, there, were, there was many emojis just with, with exasperated looks than anything else. Just, just hard to even imagine that. But it can happen to us. Uh, th this lesson is not how to stay connected. I, I, I think we know. I, we, we, hear, we hear lessons and they're good lessons. How do you stay connected to the true vine? I, I, there, there's all sorts of reasons. You know, if, if, I, if I started naming some of them, you could, you could finish that list or you could, you could extend that list. We know, I think, how to stay connected. We Stay connected to God. Stay connected to his people. Stay connected by doing things that are godly.
But for the next just couple of minutes, I want to encourage you to do some really strong examination. This is what I'm about to say is not what a preacher who just showed up and started working on the group. That's, this is what I'm about to say to you is not what a man who under those conditions could say or should say. But I'm not that man. I've been with you a while. I've been with you over 10 years. So I think, I, I think I'm old a little bit. I'll just put it out there. And I really do want you this morning to think about how closely you are attached to the vine who is Jesus. So let me talk to you. I'm going to make three observations. And I don't know how you're going to respond to them. My guess is some of you may get, uh, you get a little testy about it. That's okay. Because some of what I'm going to say is subjective. I'm just going to tell you it's subjective and I get it. And, and if you disagree, then that's fine. And you may be right. And I'm going to try to say it in such a way that, that I want to say it. But I want to suggest, the, to make these observations about staying connected to the true vine. First of all, don't allow gradual loosening. There are some folks in this church that I think are loosening their grip to the Lord. It's, that's, a, that's a very subjective statement. I get it. You're, you're not going to be cut off because you just wake up one day and say, that's it, I'm done, I, no, no more of this, no more of this connection. That's not what's happened. That's not what's going to happen to you. I don't think that's what is happening to you, but I do think from a subjective, personal standpoint, when I view and when I look and when I observe, I think there's slippage. Just my thought. And it'll be a, a turning... It'll, it'll be that gradual turning of the nut in that counterclockwise direction that will unloosen what you know God wants from you. Last Sunday, we had, if, if I saw right, we had about 50 people. We had 50 more people here Sunday morning than Sunday night. 50 more. There will be a smaller crowd tonight than there was right now. Last week, we didn't have 50 visitors. Not, not, not 50 of those people were visitors. Some of them were. We had, we had several visitors last week. But not 50. And if you're visiting with us, we frankly wouldn't expect you back tonight unless you were in the area and you wanted to be. That's not what we would expect. But for 50 people... For a difference of 50 people to be here in the morning and, and to not be here tonight, something, something's not right about that. And, and what's, what's, what I'm, all I'm asking you to do is, if you're one of those 50 people who were here last Sunday morning and not here Sunday, I'm asking you, why is that? I'm not saying that you have to be here. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going down that road. I, we, you and I can talk about that. I'm just simply asking, why, why aren't you here? I'm not, I'm not trying to make a, a right or wrong issue about it. I'm just simply asking, why aren't you here? In my personal judgment, is that when that goes on, I realize that there are times when you can't be here on a Sunday evening and you might be here on Sunday. I get all that. I understand that. I totally get it. And sometimes I think there's good reasons why you can't be here on a Sunday night. And, and uh, there are some good reasons why sometimes I can't be here with you. But I'm asking you, what are your good reasons why 
you're not going to be here tonight, but you're here this morning. I'm asking you that question. And I, and, and, if, and I think, this is, again, I think this is subjective. That what that probably says is there's some, there's a little, there's some loosening there. There's some turning that, that nut. There's some less abiding because of what you're allowing to happen to yourself and possibly an extension of your family. You need to think about it. Don't allow gradual loosening. So what do you do? Well, you tighten up. Tighten up. You, you, you reverse direction. You change direction. You, you, and you gradually tighten if necessary. You, you, you reverse. You go a different direction. And if that's what needs to happen and you can't do that quickly, then so be it. I, I'm, not, I'm not questioning motive. I'm not questioning why. I'm just simply saying, I think it's important to ask. I think it's important to ask. You need to take advantage. All of us need to take full advantage of opportunities that are presented. Now, now I want to, I, 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 I told you. I've been here a while. I feel like I can say this to you because I think you know I love you. I love, I love you. I love all of you. You know that. But sometimes I think, it's, I think I need to say things that I need to say. And today's one of those times. Godly people that, that really do want to abide in Jesus, in this true vine. Godly people take full advantage of godly opportunities. Now, let me tell you, I get it. There are things that need to take precedence over even sometimes spiritual things. Let me say that. I'll get it. And I, and I understand it. I get it. So, so don't, don't think that I'm trying to dictate everything you do. I'm not. I'm just asking you to think. And I'm going to say something to you now. It's going to come across. And it's going to, be, it's going to sound harsh. And I don't mean it to sound harsh. For several years now, we, we've done a monthly Bible study at our house on a Thursday night. It's purely, if you want to come, come. If you don't want to come, that's fine. I get that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here ready to pounce on you for not coming to our Thursday, monthly Thursday Bible. I'm not here to do that. Because I think there's good reasons why you may not. But it could be better attended. We had it this past Thursday night, around 20 people, and that's fine. We love the 20 who were there. We had a great conversation. There were some who weren't there that typically are there, and, and I'm sure they had good reasons. But just a little over 10% of this group comes to that monthly Thursday night study. Every, every single person who doesn't come may say, you know what, Kenny, that's not something that the elders have. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's something that Beth and I do. We, we, just, we, just, we just are trying to provide an opportunity because it helps us. We, we like it because it helps us. And, and it helps some of you. And, and, and many of you may just not be able to come. You work the next day. You have children. I get that. But I'm telling you, that's not all of you. And, here, and, and here's where I'm standing before you wide open saying to you, you know what? It's a good opportunity to talk about spiritual things. And I'm going to say it this way. Some of you need to be there. Because you can be. It's just not a priority. And it's okay if you don't. It's not, I'm not talking about sinful and not I'm not talking about any of that. I'm just saying... It is a way 
That happens eight, nine times a year on a night when there may not be as much going on and there may be that when some of us here get together and we talk about spiritual things. I'm only asking you, if you can be, why aren't you? That's all I'm asking. I, I don't want to move way too far in one direction. I'm, I'm not trying to swing everything to say, you know, if, if this, then this. I get it. I'm just using it as an example. Just an example. And since I'm, since I'm on a rant, you know, things, sometimes things are planned. Group meetings are planned tonight. I hope you're planning to go to your group meeting for yourself and for those people who are going to be there with you because it's, it's planned to help each other. It's planned to help us stay more connected to the vine. That's why it's planned. Are, would there be reasons why you can't go? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you go if you can go? You see, you see the difference in that? It's a way to tighten up, not, not loosen up. It's a way to tighten up. And I realize, I realize these are hard things to hear. I, I'll, I'll tell you what, I want you to think about this. They're hard things to say. But I think it's, I think it's time for me to share kind of what's on my heart. I think it's time for me to do that. And I'm going to do that for this reason. I just want you to consider. That's all I want you to do. I'm not asking you, okay, whew, let's write down everything we got to do here. Let's make sure we don't miss. Kenny going to be honest. If, if that's what you think this is about, you haven't heard me. It's not about that. But I, I know this. We give a lot of attention to a lot of things that we don't want to miss, and we don't. We take advantage of a lot of things in our lives that are out there for us to take advantage of, and we, and we don't miss. And I think that's good. I don't, I'm saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm saying, what about opportunities to stay connected to the vine? What about opportunities for you, and listen carefully, and your family to stay connected to the vine? What are the decisions that you're making, Dad and Mom? What are, the, what, are the, what are the decisions that you're making to stay connected to the vine? What's that saying to those kids who are at your house, who are living at your house? What, what are your decisions saying about how your kids feel about your connection and your family's connection to the vine? All I'm asking is for you to consider it. And if you need to make adjustments, that'd be great. Or if you don't need to make adjustments, and there, and there are really good reasons why you don't take full advantage of, of opportunities that are available. I, I get that. I get it. There may be sickness. There may be, there may be all sorts of reasons why. And some of it's just judgment. I, I'm, I can't be your conscience and you can't be mine. I get that. I'm not trying to be your conscience. I'm just asking you to think about it. That's all I'm asking. So I hope you'll do that. Thank you for listening. If you have a spiritual need this morning that we can help you with, we'd love to do that. God is good. His son's good. The spirit's good. They've all made provisions so that we can be saved. If there is something that you need to do this morning to help re either begin or to restore the relationship that you have or that you don't have, then let us help with that. Please, we'd love to help with that. If you'd make that known by coming forward, while we stand, while we sing.